back in 1943 near the RAF's famous eavesdropping radio site at Chicksands in Bedfordshire was a small hut standing alone in a field next to the road to Clop Hill. In this hut sat a young girl waiting for a telephone to ring. It was a lonely existence, often with long periods of inactivity, and she could be there at any time of the day or night, depending on what shift duty she was doing. Due to the worry of putting young girls on their own in the middle of nowhere, the military authorities issued each girl with a loaded Webley revolver, and told them to use it if anyone approached who could not identify themselves when challenged. The small team of young girls who did a lone watch for each duty were members of the Women's Royal Naval Service and were there for a special purpose, to try and determine the direction from which enemy radio transmissions were emanating. The hut was surrounded by a strange radio antenna system which consisted of four vertical metal poles which were known as adcock antennas. The coaxial feeders to these poles were buried deeply in the ground and only surfaced inside the hut. These were fed into two stationary coils of wire located at right angles to each other. A third coil which was rotatable was placed inside the other two coils and was connected by a metal shaft to an electric motor. When it was switched on, it would rotate this third coil at a predetermined speed inside the other two coils. The signal that was received in the antennas was fed direct to an American HRO communications receiver, to which a pair of headphones were attached. The signal was also fed into the Y amplifier of a Type OR2 oscilloscope. On the spinning disc of the electric motor, a small magnet was placed and, upon every rotation of the motor, a pulse would be fed from this direct into the X input of the scope. The signal could be observed directly on the screen of the scope and the face of the CRT was graduated in degrees from 0 to 180. This meant that however short the duration of the signal, the bearing could be read from the screen accurately. This system was known as the Marconi Spinning Goniometer. The procedure of the system's use was as follows. An intercept operator sitting at a HRO receiver in the Navy's wartime Y-Service monitoring station at Scarborough would hear an enemy's radio transmission, which he or she was unable to identify, and would immediately advise the supervisor who was sitting at a control panel called the concentrator. After checking with the operator, the supervisor would then decide if the transmission warranted location and, accordingly, would telephone the girl in the direction-finding hut and advise her of the frequency on which they were intercepting, to which she would immediately tune her own receiver. The supervisor would then throw a small switch on this control panel which had the effect of diverting the signal heard on the operator's receiver down a landline direct into the DF hut and into the right hand earpiece of the headphones of the DF operator. The operator would then search on the given frequency until the signal in the left hand earpiece of the headphones matched the one in the right hand earpiece which was coming down the line. In the meantime, the spinning goniometer had been switched on and the bearing of the required station was read directly on the oscilloscope by means of finding the null or minimum signal which was clearly displayed. The bearing in exact degrees was then relayed back down the telephone to the supervisor on the concentrator. Then, immediately, two further places would be advised of this. One, the Admiralty in London and two, the section known as Control at Bletchley Park. Once it had been determined whether the received signal was a new one that would be transmitting on a regular basis, a continuous watch would be kept and any signals heard were faithfully recorded and sent to the teleprinter room in the Scarborough station. It would then be sent to the Admiralty and into Hut 4 at Bletchley Park where decryption of the messages would take place. Women like this had been sworn to secrecy and never were told who or what they were listening to or what it was they were attempting to locate. 
These girls were part of the wartime eavesdropping service that spied on the enemy electronically. They were all based at the large Scarborough station and they too never knew what they were listening to as all the signals were coded five letter groups in German. In 1995 the girls decided to hold a reunion for the very first time since they were demobilised in 1945. It was difficult to arrange as they'd all long since retired and lived in very widely separated locations around the country, but eventually it was all organised and they decided that they would visit the centre of wartime code-breaking operations. So on the 20th of August 1995 they visited Bletchley Park on a special visitors day and were able to see at last just where the secret messages that they had so painstakingly intercepted during the war had been sent to and to find out exactly what was done with them. They also found out for the first time in 50 years just what a vital contribution to the final Allied victory in 1945 that their hard and often boring work had been. <laughs>